Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the neonatal fall disorders. So these are problems that you will come across during the neonatal period. And the neonatal period is really just referring to that first five to seven days of life um, when the foal can experience some fairly unique conditions to that time. Um, and as really with any condition of foal, prompt treatment can really affect the outcome, but particularly in this period. And being, you being there on the ground with the foal every day, noticing something um, quickly can make a huge difference. So just to start with, I was just going to talk about the equipment that you can have on the stud for dealing with your sick neonate. Um, heat lamps, rugs and bandages, we do insist on breeding them at the, in the coldest months of the year. Um, and so these might be used as standard anyway during um, January and February time. But a sick foal um, quickly loses its ability to be able to thermoregulate um, and will expend energy. And so by getting some heat lamps on it, bandaging the extremities and putting a rug on it can really help. Um, bottles and teats are useful to have if you've got a foal that's reluctant to stand and you want to get some colostrum into it. Or you need to give it some donor colostrum. Um, a jug, funnel and stomach tube are also useful for your, to have handy for your vet to administer colostrum or milk if, if that's required. Um, your vet probably will have this in the car, but it might be handy to have your own in case they've already been to an emergency that night and used theirs already in terms of cleanliness and not spreading disease. Um, it would be advisable. Um, a thermometer is a very inexpensive, simple bit of kit that could quickly tell you if there is a problem. If you're not quite happy with the foal, you're not sure, take its temperature. It might tell you straight away that there is a problem and you need to get call the vet. Um, having said that, if it doesn't have a temperature, um, it doesn't mean to say there isn't a problem. Um, a colostrometer or a refractometer, um, I think, is probably an essential bit of kit for testing that colostrum and checking that it's of good quality. And then a lot of studs now use enemas as routine. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a few things that it can really affect um, how your the sort of the condition of the, ne the neonate. Um, and make, potentially make life easier for you ahead. So the foaling environment, it's so important to have a clean foaling environment. As that foal is struggling to stand, usually in the first hour or so as it's cartwheeling around the, at the stable, it should have a suck reflex by then, and so we'll be starting to suck on whatever it comes into contact with, be it the mare's legs, the stable walls, your legs. And so it can ingest a lot of dirt and bacteria in that time. So it is, try and have as clean an environment as possible. The placenta, it's always good practice, I'm sure, as you know, to lay out the placenta and check it's all there. Um, we don't want to leave any in the mare. But the other reason to check it is, remember, this is where the foal, this is where the foal's been living for the last 11 months. This is its environment. And so if that placenta it looks in any way strange, it could give you a, an indication that there's something might not be right with this foal, even if you have a normal-looking foal on the ground at that stage. Is it thickened or does it look too thin in places? Does it have a funny smell to it? Is it discolored? If it's a sort of greeny brown color, that could suggest that um, it's got meconium staining um, and the foal might have um, passed some meconium during the birthing process and it's an indication of fetal distress um, and again would be an indication you need to watch that foal. Colostrum, if getting good colostrum into your foal um, is so important can be, and sets up their immune system um, and can help avoid problems ahead. Um, it, the colostrum can easily be checked with one of these refractometers. You put a, just put a drop on here. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. And then you can check the quality of the colostrum. And if it's not good quality, then you can always give it some donor colostrum if you have some available. Um, ideally, you want to be doing this within the first four to six hours. The, foal, um, the foal's guts loses its ability to absorb um, the antibodies from the colostrum between 12, between 12 to 24 hours. And also the mare is only producing colostrum for that first 12 to 24 hours. And so if she's run milk prior to foaling, um, even if her colostrum looks good when you test it, there's a chance she might not have much of it. So do keep an eye on that. So the sick neonate, how do we know if the foal, how do you know if your foal is, is ill? And often it's just intuitive, you just have a feeling. Um, but the first sign will be is usually that the foal will go off suck. Um, and so you'll see that the mare has a very full, distended bag. You might see milk on the foal's nose and down the mare's legs. Um, so do just keep an eye on that that foal is nursing properly. And even if, if you do see the, 
the foal standing next to the mare with her head under the mare. Um, check that it actually is on suck. We do get some sick foals that almost out of comfort seem to like to stand with their head under the mare and they butt the bag. The mare's letting down milk, desperately trying to encourage it to suck and probably relieve some of her discomfort as well. Um, so just make sure you check the mare's bag regularly. And as it, um, as it goes off suck, it will start to take on a very tucked up appearance. Um, it may become reluctant to, slap, to stand and be sleeping a lot, which most newborn foals do sleep a lot anyway. But do just, if you've noticed that that foal's been lying in the same pos position for a long time, go in, get it up. A normal foal should have a little stretch and then get straight on suck. And if that's not happening, then that could be an indication that something's wrong. As they start to get dehydrated, um, their eyes take on a sunken appearance and um, they get a staring coat. Um, their umbilicus might be wet, um, having been dry already, or it might never have uh, um, dried up at all. Um, so it's always good practice to keep checking the umbilicus. I'm sure you will know to spray it and treat it as soon as the foal's born, but do just keep an eye on it um, over the f that first week. And the, the foal's temperature, it might get a low temperature, it might get a high temperature as well. So these are some of the common conditions that you might see during that neonatal period. Um, I'm just going to run through them fairly quickly. But the commonest, commonest of these is probably the meconium retention. Um, seems to be mainly in overdue colts. This is probably thought to be because of their slightly narrower pelvic canal. Meconium is that first dropping that the foal fart passes in, that in, in the first 12 hours. It's a greeny, browny color. Um, can be very hard, and it's made up of digested amniotic fluid um, and gut secretions. Um, and the first signs could be straining, um, and they can progress to colicky signs, which can look quite dramatic sometimes. Um, I think the incidence of this has reduced quite a lot since a lot of studs have started to give enemas routinely um, at birth, um, and we use phosphate enemas. You can give up to two phosphate enemas, but after that, if the problem's not resolving, you'll probably need to use something else. I wouldn't advise using more than two phosphate enemas as they can absorb the, um, the phosphorus from it. So an old, old system, as you can tell from the photos, would be the, so the large volume soapy enemas. This um, rubber tubing would in be inserted into the foal's rectum. A soapy solution just allowed in by gravity and then stand back as it all flies back out again. Um, more recently, we've been using these acetylcysteine enemas. Acetylcysteine is a mucolytic, um, and it will break down the bonds, the mucus bonds within the meconium. So we administer it, we put a Foley cap, this is a Foley catheter here, we insert that up the foal's um, rectum. Then there's a balloon at the end which we inflate like that, which holds it in place. And then we um, inject the acetylcysteine solution up the catheter. The foal is usually sedated and lying down, and ideally with the hind end elevated to allow the meconium to be bathed in this solution. And then we take the catheter out after about 20 minutes. Um, and usually that will resolve most cases. Um, surgical intervention in these cases is extremely, extremely rare. I would also give some finidine sometimes in these situations and stomach tube the foal with a bit of milk mixed with liquid paraffin to help lubricate it from the other end. A ruptured bladder, that's something that could present quite like a meconium impaction. The foal could be straining and colicky. But unlike the, the meconium impaction you normally see within the first 24 hours, whereas a ruptured bladder, whilst this is thought to happen during the birth process, um, you actually only see the clinical signs really after about, 20, in that, after about 24 hours. Um, as the abdomen slowly fills with urine, it, the urine passes into the bladder and then will pass out of the tear in the bladder into the abdominal cavity. The foal may still pass urine, but it's often just small volumes. And we can diagnose this quite easily on an ultrasound. This is an, an intact bladder, and this is the ruptured bladder and free urine within the abdomen. It's very hard on ultrasound to actually see, see the tear itself. Um, and you cannot, the foal will often, the abdomen will often start to get quite distended with the urine. Um, to treat this, they usually, they will need to come into the, the clinic um, we put a catheter into the bladder to allow the urine that's being produced to drain out that way and prevent any more, try and minimize the, how much is going into the abdomen. Um, but usually these will require surgery to correct them. However, we can't do surgery straight away because the urine that's been sloshing around in the abdomen 
some of it ends up getting reabsorbed um, and then causing electrolyte imbalances in the foal, which could cause a, a pose an anaesthetic risk. So the foal usually has to go on some fluids first to sort that out before it's safe to perform the operation. Um, but the operation is usually a fairly straightforward procedure. So she who isn't a surgeon and never has to do it. So. Um, neonatal isoerythrolysis or a hemolytic foal. Um, this is um, when the foal's own um, immune system attacks its red blood cells and is similar to rhesus disease, if any of you are familiar with that in humans. Um, this is a very simplified diagram, but um, horses have se uh, several blood groups, but um, two of the commonest would be Q type Q and type A. So this would occur when, for example, the mare is type Q and the stallion is blood type A, and, they ha and has a, the foal inherits the stallion's blood type. At foaling, the mare and, and foal's blood may mix. The mare's, the mare's immune system recognizes this foreign blood and, some, and so produces antibodies to it. Um, it takes a while to produce those antibodies, and so by the time this foal has ingested her, they don't get into the colostrum in time. Um, however, this could be a problem the following, in following years if she has another type A foal. This will then in, ingest those antibodies, and that will, they will then uh, attack the foal's red blood cells um, and cause hemolysis. Conversely, if that mare with these antibodies in her colostrum has a foal that isn't a type A blood group, then that foal won't be affected. So what do we see? Um, red blood cells are involved in, they're um, primarily responsible for transporting oxygen around the body. So the foal will become very lethargic. Um, they all, the red blood cells also give that pink tinge to gums, and so it will start to look very pale, and that's why we always check gums at, um, when we check, do our newborn foal checks. May yawn a lot, have an increased respiratory rate and heart rate. As the, the foal is desperately trying to get more oxygen into the body, it will be breathing harder, um, and the heart will be pumping harder, trying to get the, more oxygen around the body. And this is especially noticeable if the foal is being handled or, or being excited for some reason. Um, a byproduct of these um, red blood cells being broken down is something called bilirubin, which causes a yellowy pigment and causes this jaundiced-like appearance. So to start off with, they will look pale, and then gradually the jaundice um, will develop. And in severe cases, this can lead to seizures and collapse. So how can we treat this? It depends on how anemic, how much, how much um, red blood cells they've lost. Um, and so if, if they're not, if they haven't lost, we have a certain level, and if they're above that certain level, then we will just treat them conservatively. We'll minimize the stress that we put them under. We will leave them in the box um, with minimal interaction with them, just go in to feed them, and that's it, leave them be. Um, and then just assess them regularly and check their red cell count doesn't drop too low. However, if it gets below a certain level, then they will require a blood transfusion. Um, we usually actually collect, use the, the mare as the donor, but obviously the mare's blood has got these antibodies in it which have caused this problem in the first place. So that blood has to be washed, um, and then we um, resuspend it and transfuse it back into the foal, transfuse it into the foal. So if you've had a mare that has had a foal, a hemolytic foal, there is always the chance that she could have another one. So really, you then need to be thinking about preventative measures. Um, if your mare is an unknown entity, if you've bought a, new, a mare and you might want to know, has she ever had a hemolytic foal, could this be a possibility? You can test mares um, for antibodies before foaling. Um, you don't know what blood type that foal is going to be. There's no guarantee that the foal would have reacted to those antibodies. You can test the foal after foaling and test the, um, test the foal's blood against the mare's blood to see if they, are, they could react. The trouble with that is foals tend to be born at outside of lab hours, um, so it's just not possible most of the time. And so really, usually what we, we go for is muzzling the foal. So we put a muzzle over on the foal as soon as it's born, and we will muzzle it for at least 18 hours. Um, at the same time, we'll strip the mare to get rid of this um, colostrum that contains the antibodies. And, so, and, put, and whilst it seems criminal to throw away colostrum, this is the one time that you should. Um, you don't want to store that colostrum. If you feed it to another foal, it could have the same effect. Um, so we usually muzzle, uh, so we muzzle the foal for about 18 hours because by that stage, the foal's gut shouldn't really absorb any more antibodies from the colostrum. 
and hopefully by that stage as well, the, colostrum, the mare will no longer be producing milk, um, colostrum, will no longer be producing colostrum and will have switched to milk. Um, if you're, um, and you can check this using your refractometer. Once the reading gets down to about 10, um, then it should be safe to put your foal back on. And usually, I've never had it happen that it's been before 18 hours. Um, and I, if it did, I think I would still wait the 18 hours just to be on the safe side. Septicemia, or blood poisoning. Um, this is, a, unfortunately, a very serious condition in the foal. Um, and if we see this in the neonate, we know we're really up against it. Um, they often present already collapsed with brick red membranes. Um, they can be in very poor condition. Um, the signs can be subtle to begin with. It could be just something like the distended back, but they do go downhill very quickly. Um, they can require a lot of nursing and intensive care, um, intravenous antibiotics. Um, and there are complications with it. This is a foal that had, was recumbent for a long time and started to get these horrible bed sores. Um, this is a foal, this clearly isn't a, a young foal, but it's got septic stifles. Um, this was over in New Zealand, not a particularly clean foaling environment there. Um, but yeah, the complications of septicemia can be joint ill, so joint infections where the infection seeds into the joint, this enlarged hop here. And osteomyelitis, that's when the infection will spread into the bone, this little punched out area here on the hop um, is where there's some infection there. Premature foal. Um, this week, uh, we would class a thoroughbred foal as being premature if it's less than 320 days. Um, less than 300 days, it possibly wouldn't really be, you'd be looking to think, would it, uh, this actually be compatible with life? Um, premature foals tend to have a fairly classic appearance. They have a domed head, floppy ears, silky coat. They can often be very slack, slack tendons, and obviously very small. Um, the other problem with the prematurity is that during those last few weeks of, um, of growth in the womb is when the lungs will develop. Um, and so these foals could be born with immature lungs and be more prone to pneumonia and respiratory disease. And the other problem is um, in the small bones in the, the knees and the hocks. Um, during those last few weeks in utero, uh, these are when they ossify, when they harden. And if they're born too early, ossification might not have even started and they just have cartilage, which is very spongy, um, instead of bone. Um, and if this happens, then these can be easily distorted as the foal weight bears um, and can lead to permanent um, distortion of these bones. These foals can, depending on how severe they are, they can require a lot of nursing. And if you have a collapsed foal that's going to take a lot of nursing, I would always x-ray these areas, first of all, so that you know what you're dealing with and whether you realistically are going to have an athlete at the end of it, and then the owner can make an informed decision as to whether to continue. Umbilical infection would be a fairly common uh, problem in the foal. Um, the umbilicus is obviously widely recognized as a, an entry point for an infection, and we treat it uh, at birth. But do, as I mentioned before, do keep an eye on it um, and check that the umbilicus remains, remains dry. Signs of infection, would, it starts to get thickened. You might see a, a sort of purulent discharge from it. Um, and just remember, the umbilicus was, is obviously the remnants of the umbilical cord, which contained vessels from the fetus to the mare. And these vessels still exist inside the foal, the remnants of them. And it is possible for an infection to track internally. And we can, we can check that very easily with an ultrasound scanner. This is the bladder, and these are the enlarged uterine um, umbilical arteries, sorry. Um, and so in those situations, it would suggest the foal would need a, a prolonged course of antibiotics. We need to monitor. Um, another component of the umbilicus uh, or the, is the uracus, which is the tube that connected the bladder to the umbilical cord. And this, is, as the umbilical cord snaps, this reflexly, reflexly closes. Um, but when the umbilicus gets infected, uh, um, this can often open up again, and you might see the foal urinating through the umbilicus. Um, usually, it's fairly straightforward to treat with antibiotics and dipping of the, of the navel. Fractured ribs are a common foaling complication. Um, can happen uh, with if you've got a very large foal, or if it's been a problem foaling, they've had a leg back or something, 
or if it's been a very explosive falling, um, a very quick falling. And sometimes it could be the perfect falling and you find them totally unexpectedly. Um, I think it's prob we probably find them more in, um, on studs where they tend to pull every foal out versus studs that let the, leave the mares to it and only um, sort of step in if they really need it. Um, but the ribs obviously uh, are designed to protect some very important organs, the heart, the lungs, the diaphragm, which is that sheet of muscle which separates the thorax, the chest, um, from the abdominal cavity, prevents. And so if a foal fractures a rib, and most commonly we see them around this area here, around the sixth rib, behind the elbow, um, and that's why at a foal check, um, certainly I will always run my hands down the foal's chest, behind the elbows, feel every rib, rock the foal. You can often feel the rib moving then in that case, or I might just feel an indentation. Sometimes you might just only feel a, a bit of thickening, a plaque of edema, um, and not actually feel a, be able to feel the rib. If that's the case, then it is quite, you could easily ultrasound it. Here's the rib, and you can see the fracture there. And the problem we have with fractured ribs is sort of demonstrated here. This, this fractured end of the rib is, is heading into the, into the foal. Um, and as I said, we've got the heart, we've got the lungs there, and these could pierce those um, and obviously cause a lot of damage. So our approach in these situations is to keep the foal rested, minimize the exercise until those ribs have knitted back together again. Um, and this can take a varying amount of time from two to four weeks usually. Um, and I tend to be very conservative about it because I just, the risk of a, a lung punch or a heart punch would be catastrophic. Um, um, very occasionally, um, these might be operated on if, if a large amount of ribs have been damaged, for example, several in a row um, with pl very tiny plates or wires, but I personally have never had to refer a foal for that. And this brings me to the last um, condition I was going to talk about, um, neonatal maladjustment syndrome. Um, is it's a, is as it's known now, but these are the, the dummy foals or wanderers or barkers, you might also know them as. Um, and they're that foal, that stupid foal that just won't get on suck. It's doing everything else and you really want to go home and it's standing and it's moving around, but it just won't get on suck. Um, and no matter how hard you try, it just doesn't get the hang of it. It doesn't seem to be bonding with the mare. Um, it can be wandering around the box aimlessly. Um, and in, it can progress to more severe signs um, like seizures and uh, coma. And they could be, the signs could be apparent immediately from birth or they may develop a bit later over the next few hours. Um, it's thought to be due to, it, well, it used to be thought to be due to a, hypo, a hypoxic episode um, during the birth process so that the foal um, suffered from a lack of oxygen during the birth process. Um, however, more recent research thinks in some foals, it seems to be that the foal just doesn't switch from the unconscious sort of state that is, it's in in the uterus. So in the uterus, um, it wouldn't be good for the foal to be galloping around and moving around. And so there are um, something called neuroinhibitors in the foal's bloodstream, which are preventing the foal from doing that, which are keeping it in this unconscious state. And as it's squeezed through the birth ca canal um, and... Um, comes into contact with light, touch, smell, and the birth, that's enough to stimulate, stimulate it to wake up into the conscious state. But uh, recent research has found that in these uh, dummy foals, a high proportion of them ha still have these inhibitory neurosteroids in their circulation, or they um, may go on to develop them again. And it's like, so it's like the switch from, conscious st from unconscious state to conscious state just hasn't been flicked in this case. Um, so our approach has been really to support the foal. Usually they will, 80% of these will recover um, and go on to lead normal lives and certainly group winners have been, um, have started life as dummy foals. So the foal needs to be kept warm. We might have to stomach tube it with, um, with milk. We, can, we often put these indwelling nasogastric stomach tubes in so we're not constantly having to, to stomach tube it and upset it. Uh, we might need to give it IV fluids, and in the serious cases where they start to seizure, give anticonvulsants. But it requires a lot of intensive care and patience and time. And these are often the, um, 
the major factors that um, can cause a problem because it's always in the middle of a bu busy season and you can't spare the staff to, to deal with it or the expense um, that it will take um, to get the foal right because they can take they can take days sometimes up to a week or two um, to come right so it's it is a lot of a lot of care is required um, but then more recently um, Professor John Madigan um, from University of California Davis um, developed a technique called the uh, from the Madigan foal squeeze um, so this has been, it's been known for a long time that if you squeeze a newborn foal, they will, st they will flop and they will, they will go down. Um, and the Madigan foal squeeze has been developed to, to mimic the squeezing of the foal as it goes through the birth canal. And the idea is it is hoping to um, so mimic that, that unconscious state. And then when you remove the, the pressure, hopefully that's enough to flick the switch to, to bring the foal back to its conscious state. Um, and so, using ropes, they, they apply this squeeze. And I've got some video of him doing it here. Hopefully. This is Professor Madigan himself demonstrating. Um, so he ties it th between the front legs. You can't quite see, but that rope's passed between the front legs. This is a bow knot, I believe. Any sailors or scouts out there can correct me. Um, so he ties that up, and this is similar to the technique used for casting cattle. Um, passes it round, um, and then loops it through, and then we'll pass it back round again. So it passes round the foal's chest twice. He'll do it one more time. And he has the, the sort of the knots lining up along the spine. These are over the ribs here. So at this stage, this is when you apply pressure. Sometimes you need a bit of room because they can resist to begin with. And as long as pressure is applied on that rope, that foal should stay in that somnolent state. Um, and their heart rate decreases, their breathing rate decreases, and they seem to have less um, of response to painful stimuli. It can be used to, to do fairly simple procedures like uh, casting a limb or a plasma transfusion um, as well in a normal foal. Um, and then this is just they, so the foal is still asleep. They remove the, the ropes and up it gets. There are plenty of videos of this on, on YouTube of showing dummy foals having this done and then up they get and get straight on to suck, but they were just a bit too long um, to play here, much as I was tempted to do that and not have to speak much. Um, so the restraints on this is he, uh, Professor Madigan advises that they that performed in foals under three days of age. Um, he suggests a soft rope of three, inch, three, and a quarter, three quarters of an inch diameter, 16 to 18 feet long, should slide easily. Um, in the middle of the night, I've used lunge ropes if needs be, and they seem to work as well. Um, but don't use, if, not to be used if the foal has never stood, so if it's a recumbent foal, if it's got a rib fracture, because obviously that rope is part, would be passing straight over the, the fractured rib and would cause compression on it, um, and so it could do a lot of damage. Um, equally, if the foal is showing signs of respiratory distress, the last thing you want to be doing is compressing its chest. If the foal has sepsis or is premature, it's got some other problem as well. It's not just a, because it's a dummy foal. Um, he has recently published a paper um, comparing using the foal squeeze technique with medic, just using medical treatment alone and has found that if the foal squeeze technique is used, foals recover significantly quicker. I wouldn't say a higher proportion recover because they usually, they, 80% should recover anyway. It's just with the foal squeeze technique, it can save you on a lot of time and expense and veterinary fees. So I probably shouldn't really even be telling you about it. But um, uh, So it's, it's worth giving a go. Um, and certainly in Newmarket, we've started trying it and have had... Um, some success with it, not every time. I wouldn't say it's the, the cure-all, but certainly it's worth 
giving a go. Um, so really in summary, um, be familiar with, your, with the normal so you can act on, act on your instinct when you realize something is abnormal because often you're right um, and if we can get there quickly and do something quickly it can um, vastly improve the outcome. If you can supervise the falling, it can tell you if there could be problems ahead. Attention to hygiene, making sure the fall gets that colostrum. And like I say, early recognition of problems and prompt treatment can make all the difference. Um, thank you very much, and just a thank you to Professor Madigan for letting me using, use his videos. Thank you.